I was born in Brunswick to two extremely old-fashioned Italian parents that came from poor southern Italy. They were Catholic, though not practising. They were uneducated, recluse, suspicious and judgmental of everyone and everything outside of our family home. My father was frightening, cruel, unreasonable and an abusive man. My mother was a young, anxious, timid woman. I was very much like her, easy to bully and the perfect target for my father. She and I and my two younger siblings lived in fear of him. He had created a loveless, oppressive home, just like the one he grew up in. It was like living in a prison and walking on eggshells. So during those years, just thinking back, it was just, I remember an oppressive fear the whole time. Um, Fear of my father and fear of the dark and fear of things that I didn't even know. Just a general feeling of horrible fear the whole time. And also terrible shame um, because my parents were different. Um, not only that they were Italian, but they were different to all the other Italians. Um, They were just so secretive and so... They didn't have anything to do with other people and we couldn't have people over and mum was fussy with the OCD and she was always crying and um, that sort of thing. And um, the shame I felt that my mother couldn't speak English and I had to translate for her at her doctor's appointments and my doctor's appointments because I was always in and out of doctors um, due to a skin disease that I had since I was a toddler Um, and that was called psoriasis and that covered me completely Um, and I felt shame at that because I was different. I looked different because I was covered in a skin disease. I was Italian. My parents were defective, I I felt. I was defective And um, I just didn't want people to know how defective I was inside. And I used to try and cover it up. Um, Okay, back to the notes now. I grew up feeling anxious and afraid, lacking any confidence due to the oppressive environment that I was living in. To make matters worse, I also had a severe form of psoriasis, which I've already explained. The... The kids at school made me their punching bag. Um, once they, once or twice, they chased me to the toilets and <laughs> pulled, pulled my pants down to see, you know, if I had it all over my backside and that. So that was pretty horrible. Um, so school, so school as well as home was not safe. Though I was shy, my personality didn't fit the submissive Italian, southern Italian girl mould. I was a bit different. I had a flair for fashion, art and an eagerness for learning, for studying and learning, reading and learning new things. My father, having grown up in a harsh, rigid, in harsh, rigid times, was intimidated by this. Um, So though we all suffered, I received the full, thank you, the full brunt of the abuse. Is that better? (laughs) He'd pretty much find any petty excuse to give me a beating, a blood nose, bruises, just punching my head all the time, all that sort of thing. And he'd tell me how he wished I was dead, how much he hated me, how, how, (laughs) sorry, how worthless I was and sorry. Um, and how no one would ever want to marry me because I was ugly and had skin disease and I was just crap. Um, when my mother stood up for me, my siblings and I would watch as she was beaten in fear. So shame and fear was right through my childhood, through most of my teen years when the abuse, sorry, I didn't mean to cry, (laughs) 
was at its peak. I remember not being allowed to sit, thank you, sit um, with the family at the dinner table. Um, I had to eat sitting at the bench on my own. Sometimes my brother would join me so I wouldn't be alone. Um, I couldn't travel in the family car a lot of the time because I wasn't, didn't deserve to go in the car, I was told. Dad would drive past me later on in my teens. He'd drive past me walking to work, drive right past me and not even pick me up. Um, and if Dad told a joke or, you know, said something a little bit funny and I laughed, I'd get into trouble and get told, you know, sort of, who told you, to, who said you could laugh, sort of thing. Um, so this is just an example of what life was like. Um, my escape from bullying at school and home came from reading and hiding in the library at school. I consumed books just like I still do. I came across stories about depressed girls, much like myself, girls that would cut their wrists, commit suicide, take drugs. This really struck me. So I made multiple attempts to hurt myself and take my own life, though I don't think I really wanted to die. It was more a cry for help out of pain frustration, anger, sadness, and stuff like that. The sadness, persistent fear, and constant state of being misunderstood and judged was so heavy and overwhelming. Um, I used to daydream about, as a really young girl, and for years and years, about um, falling down on the ground, fainting or something, or having an accident and a nice man would come and pick me up and, <laughs> you know, uh, hold me and carry me and all that sort of thing. And I just kind of yearned for that sort of thing. And I had a couple of nice aunties and uncles that used to um, stick up for me and try and talk to Dad and, you know, um, try and talk sense into him and ask him why was he like this toward me. He was too harsh and... I could hear him from the bedroom um, saying stuff like, you know, awful things like a hater and she's this and that. And I remember one night just crying and crying and just screaming. I couldn't stop screaming from the crying. I just became hysterical because the pain and fear was just too much. The hate that I felt from him was too much at that time. Um, my sister and I, all we wanted to do was get out of there, but I, my sister's a year younger than me and um, <clears throat> she wanted to leave too. And she asked me not to leave until she was ready to leave. And I said, yeah, I'll wait for you. So I was 18, she was 17, and um, we left with no warning. We worked together at a factory um, we went to the beach, it was a hot summer day, we went to the beach with our workmates knowing that if we, we'd be in trouble if we went home after that because we weren't allowed to do things like that. So we thought, okay, this is it, tonight we don't go home, we leave. We stayed in our um, workmates' caravan, which was in their family's front yard, and that was our home for the next few months. We were naive girls with newfound freedom, living with friends, trying to find the love and acceptance in boys, wrong boys who drank and abused us. When my first boyfriend dumped me, um, I was 18 then, I was completely devastated because I thought he was going to marry me and I believed all his stuff. Um, I felt like... I felt like I was going to burst from the pain and the sorrow. I wanted to hurt myself again, so I did, um, with a blade to my wrist over an ashtray as my sister watched. And I just felt that I had to do that. Blood had to come out, and I don't know why, but I just had to punish myself because I couldn't punish other people. Um, so it had to be me. When my... It was just the, the pent-up anger and the pain and everything, you know. So I knew that what I was doing was wrong, the cut, you know, punishing myself like that, but couldn't, just couldn't stop it. 
I put my sister through that horrible thing, you know, and she was trying to understand what I was doing and couldn't. When my ex-boyfriend's parents heard what their son had done to me, they took my sister and I in as kind of stepdaughters, foster, foster kids. All we'd wanted was a family, parents, to love us and look after us. Um, we had somewhere to live, but these people used us to do their housework. They were good in some ways, but they used us to, to do their housework and other stuff. The mother was a jealous lady because her husband, who was the stepfather of my ex-boyfriend, um, he was a bit perverted. He'd walk around in his underwear and, um, you know, when I we'd say that was weird, he'd say it's natural, it's fine, and um, he'd molest us and all this type of stuff. Um, all the more the depression and anxiety got worse. I had another boyfriend who dumped me and another, a few more, one who raped me. Then I hurt myself again and it was just the same old thing over and over till I was about 19. Then I went to... I cut my arms and um, I went into a psych hospital, which is where I wanted to go because I knew I needed help. Um, and that's where I met Midge, my soon-to-be partner. Midge and I were quite different, but in some ways similar. He was an alcoholic, drug user and involved in petty crime. He had hurt, he had hurt himself as well. Long, deep cuts were across his arms that showed me that he meant business and it was frightening to see his arms. But um, we had common ground in that. We understood each other and also he was a lovely, sensitive person. We could talk to each other. I felt like I just felt for once, you know, I could talk to someone and he'd listen and I felt that he cared about me and we fell in love, moved out. Soon I was pregnant at 19 with my first daughter, Jade. Pretty soon life with him became relentlessly horrendous though as um, the full extent of his drug use, and drug and alcohol abuse um, was evident. He, he'd inject anything he was a jockey and had access to horse tranquilizer. He'd inject that. Tried to get me to do some, and I tr tried once, but I don't have good veins, so that didn't work, thank God. Um, Mitch was in and out of jail. Soon he was in jail, and I was for stealing, and I was alone and pregnant. Mitch got out of jail when I was in hospital four months later when I was in hospital having Jade and that night he was back in jail for being drunk and drugged in someone's backyard. So the new life that I thought we were going to have with our baby was shattered right there and I took up, I'd given up smoking during the pregnancy and I took it up again the next day. And then things could continued on the same way. He'd, he'd repeatedly cheat on me with other girls behind my back. At parties, he'd flirt with them in front of me. And all that was just really, um, just made me feel horrible. And I, um, also he'd have his mates over in our one bedroom apartment and um, the bedroom and the, the lounge were just one room with the curtain in between. And uh, he and his friends would be doing all the drugs and having magic mushies and I'd be trying to um, breastfeed my new baby. And, um, yeah, I, I'd have to go in the bathroom and do that. He tried to change, but it never lasted. He went in and out of rehab, but never lasted. So after four years, I left him. I moved to the Gold Coast and dated my now ex's friend so that was another new low he was another alcoholic 
though I didn't think he was as bad as my ex. Turned out that he was. I suffered more abuse from him. But the worst was when he molested my daughter and she was only five or six. <laughs> it, was, it was very difficult to plan my escape from him as he was extremely violent. But I gained courage and I broke up with him. Um, when I broke up with him, when I told him, my daughter and I were in the bathroom. He came in, smashed a mirror um, at, with the broken shard in front of my daughter and I, slashed his throat and said, if he couldn't have me, no one could. So, you know, the ambulance took him away and he survived that. Life went on. Um, I was single for a while and I had I dated some guys, some nice ones and some awful ones. Um, I found happiness in going to nightclubs, partying, dancing, music. Dancing and music was really big. I lived for that. Um, and just loved going out with my friends, just having a good time dancing, having a couple of drinks um, and a bit of social smoking. But I was still anxious, lacking confidence, looking for love in all the wrong places, lonely, depressed and suffering from frequent panic attacks. So I began hypnosis treatment which my doctor had put me on to. And then I found, I thought that it kind of helped for a while. He put me on medicine too. He said I was depressed and anxious and needed medicine. With the hypnosis, um, I had no idea that it was something bad and evil. Um, I just want to say that when I first went and saw that psychiatrist, Dr McElrath, I sat across him at the desk and he talked about, oh, yeah, you need hypnosis. And I, I wasn't a Christian then and I didn't know spiritual things, but something, I felt that a presence came out of him, like a power that hit, kind of hit me and made me feel floppy, strange, and it was very scary. Nevertheless, I disregarded that and had the hypnosis treatment, had a few sessions. Um, but the fear and the panic continued, especially at night. It just grew. Then I'd have a sense of at night I'd wake up with the room, feeling that the room was spinning and there was a presence in the room. That's how it felt. But in those days I didn't know about demons and stuff like that. I had constant fear, fear of people and what they'd think of me, um, fear of being ridiculed, fear that I'd say the wrong thing. I used to go red all the time, you know, so I'd hate talking to people. Um, yeah. I had Also, I had a constant fear, but I didn't know what I was afraid of. That was a really overriding, heavy thing in my life. Then one of my friends went away for a few months. He came back and he'd become a Christian. He shared the gospel with me and with Jade, who was then about nine years old. I didn't know, but behind my back she received Jesus and he baptised her in our pool. And I got annoyed when I found out. Because <laughs> I, I thought he was in some sort of cult um, one night he explained to me the importance of being born again, although I thought he was in a cult. I asked him to show me from the Bible because somehow I knew the Bible was true and could be trusted. But I'd always believed in God. Um, since I was a little girl, I'd always prayed to God, always asked him to help me. Um, but... It was in a selfish sort of a way. It was just kind of like, help me, help me type of thing, just to do what I wanted to do and not to be afraid and to help me give up my eating disorder, which I had too. Um, um, 
yeah, I had that for a few years. So each time that I'd have episodes of the eating disorder, I'd feel disgusted with myself and, you know, say, God, I'm so sorry. Please help me not to do this. I don't want to do this. Please help me, you know, and just... Um, that's how life was, you know. So my prayers were like that. But I'd also pray to Mary a little bit. Um, not that much, but because I was brought up as a Catholic and I'd had a bit of religious instruction, that was all I knew about the Lord. I'd never read the Bible, so except for a couple of times, a couple of years ago, but it didn't, just a couple of page, random pages, none of it made sense to me. Going back to Brad, I said, prove it to me from the Bible about being born again and what you're saying, that it's true. When I started reading, the words came alive. It was like a light, light bulb came alight in my head, in my mind, and I wanted to know more and I kept reading that night. I just kept reading and it all made, it made sense. And I, I just wanted to know more and more and more. Um, that was when Brad told me, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you to be saved. Um, and I realised, in hindsight, you know, I realised that for the past two months, while he'd been away praying for me, I'd not felt like going to nightclubs anymore. I felt no more joy in that and no more joy in the things that I'd previously found joy in. And I couldn't understand why, but then when Brad told me he'd been praying, then it started making sense. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, Brad took me to an evangelistic crusade where Pat, M Pat Massini, I don't know, if, yeah, was um, preaching, and um, I got saved that night with my really, really short dress and very, very short blonde hair and just... <laughs> I was the odd one out in there, but I got saved and I really meant it. I... Um, he spoke about sin and repentance, how... why Jesus came, and it all made sense, and I knew I wanted Jesus... <laughs> Sorry. So I got born again and I was really happy that I did. I was going to churches regularly, to church and Bible study. Um, at night time we'd be visiting different churches, but all these churches were, the teaching was shallow. They were word of faith type churches, Pentecostal, name and claim, your healing, your deliverance, all that sort of thing. I'd be praying for healing and deliverance, you know, from the, the fear and the anxiety, the skin disease, which I still had, and I never got any of that. And I was pretty upset that I didn't, and I wondered why. And I was focusing on those things. I wasn't focusing on sin and repentance and stuff because I only understood sin and repentance a little bit, you know, from when I first got saved, but it wasn't a thing that was really taught in the churches that I went to or Bible study. Um, a little bit at Bible study was taught about putting down the old man and now you're a new creation, but it wasn't explained and I didn't really get it all that much, just a little bit, but I knew that I had to change and I kept asking God to help me to change and um, God helped me give up smoking like in a week or two I just stopped completely um, I tried before but never been able to stop um, the nightclubs and that they stopped really soon um, in a month or two I, my boyfriend um, I gave him up I knew I had to do it it broke my heart but I did because I knew it was wrong um, in the Lord's eyes. Um, okay. At the at the Bible studies and prayer meetings that we were having, um, I prayed for my family's salvation. 
um, it was really important for me to be reunited with my family, um, to make up with my father. Um, I, can't, I did forgive him before I became a Christian, but it wasn't a Christian type of forgiveness. I always wanted to make up with him, but he never wanted to. Um, but anyway, so we prayed for their salvation, for forgiveness, for reconciliation. Um, a few months later, I had an opportunity. Um, my father went overseas to Italy because his father was dying. So I went and stayed with mum in Melbourne. Um, Jade and I both stayed with mum. And I shared the gospel with mum and my brother and sister and they got saved. Um, my brothers and sisters' salvation was kind of just, uh, wasn't really genuine at that time. My mother's, I believe, was. Um, Dad came back from Italy and I waited at my sister's house in Bendigo because I'd prayed, Lord, I'll wait for Dad to come back. The family were going to talk to Dad. This is what we talked about. And they were going to ask Dad, they were going to say, Nat's been here and just talk about everything that I'd, we'd talked about and about the Christianity and that I'd changed and would he agree to making up with me. And this time he did. <laughs> Unbelievable. Answered prayer. It was amazing. Answered prayer. So we met up. Um, my sister and I met up with Dad a few days later and um, he was still judgmental and all that sort of thing and what have you done and look at the mess you got yourself into and all the rest, but he did say, come and live back home with us. And um, I decided to do that because Jade and I had already talked about that and um, I'd talked to the Lord about it before, you know, and just had decided, you know, had talked to the Lord and said to the Lord, if you want me to leave, move in with my parents and help them become Christians and find a church and just make, you know, just reconcile properly, let dad, mum and dad, ask me to move back in. So I did. Um, okay, so I, a couple of months later, I moved in with my parents, found a church, which was Christian City Church in Keeler. Um, once again, it was shallow preaching, not much on sin, repentance, putting down the flesh and sanctification. We pretty much all had a good time there. Um, if you had problems, you know, you were told to just go and pray in tongues and that sort of thing. And there were a lot of um, altar calls and um, prayer, you know, come to the front for prayer if you've got a need, all that sort of thing. Um, I'd always go to the front for healing, um, but I'd never fall over backwards unless they pushed me. Because by then I'd worked out, you know, this I, this doesn't line up with what the Bible's saying. So I started to see different things between what they were teaching and what the Bible was saying. Um, and I started to get courage to speak up a little bit. Because up until then I didn't really have much courage to speak up. Um Okay, so, yeah, the anxiety and all that, that still continued. Um, the loneliness and then praying for a husband, I've got underlined here. So I was lonely. I wanted a husband. I prayed for a husband. I went to Mauritius for a few months for my brother's wedding um, to Juliet and her cousin, Patrick. I met him there. I was there for a few months. I met him there. Um, I didn't really seek God's will in marrying Patrick. I tried to tell myself I did, but I didn't. I didn't wait on God for an answer. Patrick was a Catholic, a believer, but a Catholic, and who sometimes read his Bible, and I thought that would be enough. Um, we got married, and then I came back to Australia 
Pat waited a year for his visa before joining me in Australia. Okay, this is where the notes end. <laughs> um, so he joined me in Australia after a year and I'd been waiting and waiting and just couldn't wait for him to join me. Um, and right from the first week there were massive problems because who I thought he was isn't who he was. So there was mistrust and lack of bad communication and just a whole lot of things going on. Um, I won't go into details about that. Um, he wanted to have a baby straight away and I didn't because of the marriage problems. I wanted counselling and he didn't. Um, after six years, I was 38 and I thought if I don't get pregnant now, it's going to be too late. Um, and I got pregnant quickly. I went off the pill and got pregnant in a couple of months with Courtney. Um, I had Courtney, I was 39. Patrick and I, yeah, the problems were continuing. And um, we, by that time, we weren't going to church. We weren't really fellowshipping, though we tried different churches here and there, but all we found was Alpha teaching, Rick Warren teaching, name and claim and all that sort of thing. And, it, you know, I, I was really looking for something that was faithful to the word, something that was real. And I'd already heard Jacob Prash's teachings. From, I'd seen, I'd been to a few of his meetings um, and also um, Philip Powell. I've been to some of his meetings and I used to receive their newsletters as well as Dave Hunt's books and newsletters. So I got a lot out of that. Um, but no fellowship, no marriage counselling. Um, the marriage went down. It just got worse and worse. Um, yeah, I, I think Courtney was five when I left Patrick because I couldn't just couldn't take it anymore. I was just falling apart. So I left him. I was very frustrated and I felt guilty too for leaving him. And then, wouldn't you know it, you know, I was in relationships again. Um, yeah, so back into the old lifestyle. Um, having panic attacks really bad again. And one lovely lady, um, Jackie Bell, from the Independent Baptist Church that I'd gone to a few times but left when Rick Warren teaching came in and then the church split, so I left there. She was in touch with me and she used to counsel me and she said, you need to get right with God and you need to try to reconcile your marriage, which I did try to do. And I spoke to Pat you know, and asked him to come to counselling, but he wouldn't be in it. But I'd go to counselling and, you know, try, I repented and tried to get back on the right track with the Lord. Um, but still there was more backsliding for me to do, living in the world and enjoying my freedom, but also feeling really guilty because I knew that this lifestyle dating, um, dancing, going to clubs, living for myself and having fun was not what the Lord wanted. Um, things got really bad when I um, I had a, a relationship with this guy for about three months and I really loved him and he... Um, dumped me and he went back to England and I was just devastated. Um, the panic attacks and anxiety was really bad. God broke me down and brought me to the end of myself and showed me that you're trying to find happiness in a, a man loving you. You're trying to take away the loneliness by, you know... Um, looking for a man to love you, um, people accepting you, people, 
being able to do things and people recognising that you can do things and you're trying to find self-worth and happiness in that because I felt like I couldn't do things, I had no skills or talents. I felt like a dud. Um, and I kind of, I didn't want people, unless I knew them really, really well, I didn't want them to see how sad and broken and lonely I was inside because I thought it was pretty, pretty pathetic. And if people knew what I was like inside, how pathetic I was, they, they, they'd be bored with me. They wouldn't want to know me. That's how I always felt. Um, During that, during that time of being broken after that guy left, um, I dated a little bit more, probably for another month or two, and, you know, did the dancing and the nightclub thing and helped to teach a dance class. Um, but then I just was brought down. God brought me down really, really low. Um, I started reading the Bible again. And I was reading Psalm 119. I'd always go back to that psalm. Um, and I was attracted to it. I was attracted to how David said, Lord, it is good that you've chastised me, that you've disciplined me. It is good that I've gone through all these sorrows because now I've repented and come back to you. And that's what I was doing. That's what I wanted to do. And that's what... Um, God was doing with me. He was, he was, I was ready to repent. I could see that sin and I hated it and I didn't want to be like that anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so New Year's Eve 2007 or 8, 2007, I prayed and repented of everything with a new understanding of the Lord and his word. Um, and I really, really meant it. And ever since then, I've never looked back. I've never, ever gone back into that old way of life into seeking those pleasures in all wrong people, wrong places. It's only been since then the Lord, only him. I found, I went back to the Independent Baptist Church because part of the people who went away from the Rick Warren teaching formed a new church, so I joined them. And they were really solid, really good. I explained to them what happened and they accepted me and helped me, counselled me. And I was with them for about a year. Um, and I grew in the Lord. And all I wanted to do was live for him, please him and not live for me. I remember understanding um, what it meant to put off the old man. I had a new understanding of that, not the shallow understanding that I'd previously had. And um, that's what I kept asking the Lord to do. And ever since, even still now, helped me to put off that old man, not to follow that flesh, not to be led by it, but to be led by your spirit and to please you and seek you and please you in everything I think and everything I do. And not to, I don't want to be the centre of my universe. My happiness isn't important. It doesn't matter. Salvation is what matters. And I just want to say that the peace that came from, from that, from repenting, from that godly sorrow that he gave me and that repentance that he gave me, coming back to him and the beautiful peace that he gave me, no longer having to sleep with the light on, which I did for years and years. It was just amazing, just really amazing. After that, I prayed 
about coming to Frankston because my older daughter moved here because she was having she had a baby Clancy who's now nine um, and I wanted to be with my daughter so much and help her and just be with her and my grandson so you know I moved to Frankston and um, not before looking into I knew there was a church here Moriel but through Moriel there was a church here that was faithful to God's word and I remember contacting Pastor Lionel and just asking him a few questions. And I knew there was a Christian school in Frankston for Courtney. And um, I didn't know where the money would come from for that, but I wanted her to go to a Christian school again. And um, I just can't say what a difference it's made to be in a church like this. It's such a difference. I've never had a family like this in my whole life. Never. People have never loved me and supported me like this, ever. Not even my own family. And um, people here have allowed me to grow in the Lord and to focus on him, to be a mother to Jade and to Courtney, to be a rock for Jade and Courtney because they've been going through a lot of things through the wrong decisions I've made and just through life in general. Pastor Lionel and Suzanne um, have been a great help. Suzanne's counselled Courtney and I with our fears and anxiety and given us real um, good advice about reading the word and renewing the mind and Get, getting rid of those old thought patterns and just renew your mind and think in a different way and apply scripture to your life. And it really, really makes a difference. It's made a difference to me. And I know it's made a difference to Courtney too. And I've still got a long way to go. I'm still a work in progress. But the Lord has done it. And whatever I go through now, even if it's bad... It's scary, it's bad, even getting up here today. It's, I hate public speaking, but it's for the Lord and for all you guys to encourage you guys. It's not about me anymore, you know, focusing on me and, oh, you know, this is scary, or, you know, um, the Lord is with me and he helps me. He doesn't take the stuff away. I have to go through it and by going through it, I grow and become... um, sharpened in my character and become the person he wants me to be and he's with me empowering me and this is what I've experienced through being through that real repentance coming back to him and being in a church that's faithful to God's word and being with people who are who aren't perfect but are loving supporting Christians it just makes all the difference in the world so thank you Pastor Lionel and Suzanne for your faithful teaching, for being faithful to God's word, which is, it's just made all the difference. And it's, I've been searching for this all my life. So you guys are my family now. Um, And thank you everybody here for your love and support. And most of all, all praise and thanks and glory to God for the how much he loved me and how he he kept working on me and kept bringing me back, breaking me more and more each time, but picking me up and bringing me back until I got it. Thank you.